and you know the thing is the hardest part about this conversation is I want to ask you all the same questions. <laughs> <laughs> you don't get to my show. Um. <laughs> So today's guest on Street You Grew Up On is one of my favorite people in the biz. His career is so inspiring. He has given us dynamic, powerful performances on stage and television and film. His production company, 3AD, is putting work narrative out into the world that is truly making the world a better place. I know you're gonna love hearing about his story, so please help me welcome Daniel Day Kim. <laughs> So to jump right in, to learn the name of the street you grew up on, I'm gonna ask you your porn name, if that's okay, and that is the name of your first pet and the street that you grew up on. I got a pretty good one, I think. Tiki Blenheim. That's like pros, I like that. That's really good. Right? What was Tiki? Was legit. Tiki a, a cat or a dog? Tiki was a little uh, toy poodle. She was given to me, to our family, by a family that couldn't take care of her. Uh, and so she was pre-named. Uh, she came named Tiki. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Right. And did you, will you yeah. tell me about the street you grew up on? Like the house in particular. Was it a house or an apartment? My parents and I immigrated uh, to America. When we, when we immigrated, we first moved to New York. Mm. We were in the Bronx and then we were in Long Island. Wow. Uh, but, You're a fellow you know, Bronx say, boy. I didn't yeah, know we I, shared yeah. that history. Mm -hmm. Because we moved, moved around so much. When I think about childhood, yeah. I think about Blenheim Drive. And so that's that's why I'm happy to talk about that one. Those were your formative years. Yeah. Yeah. It was in Pennsylvania in a town called Easton. It was really just this idyllic suburb. And my house was this kind of slate blue, kind of aluminum siding house mm. uh, with one, two, three, four bedrooms. Uh, and it was like... It was like a piece of Americana. It was mm. the, uh, you know, we had a, a almost a, you could have pictured a white picket fence outside of the house. That's and the that kind of would house be it. Was. Do you think that's why your parents chose it? Did it feel like they had stepped into the dream they had emigrated for? Yeah, I think that that has a lot to do with it. It was a suburb back when suburbs were the thing. Mm. It was the kind of neighborhood where after school. We all the kids would walk uh, would walk to each other's houses, knock on the door, and say, "Can Scott or Johnny come out and play?" And then when it got dark or when it was dinner, the moms would come out and they would just say, "Danny, dinner time!" And you'd hear oh. echoes around the neighborhood saying, "Scott, dinner time! Mike, dinner time!" And that's how we all knew to come home for to our houses for dinner and. And, you know, wow. half the time, one of my friends would come over to my place for dinner. Or I'd eat dinner at their place. And so you'd mm. hear, like, echoes of, like, can I eat over at Scott's? Or can I eat at <laughs> Bill's? It really felt like a, a vision of the way I always envisioned, I, I always thought life should be. I was, like, uh, you know, in, in second and third grade, and all of my friends were of different races and, and religions. And... And so I never, ever thought that I, I was different. Um, I never looked at people based on, you know, what, what their race was or what their religion was. And, and I always felt incredibly accepted. That's where I get a lot of my feelings about, you know, harmony uh, and, and, and the way we can, and, and unity uh, from, from that neighborhood. As I mentioned to you, though, I moved in sixth grade mm. and I moved to the neighboring town. And I moved at a time where, you know, hormones started kicking in, like junior mm -hmm. high school and high school. Mm -hmm. And I didn't grow up with the same group of kids who didn't see race first. They saw the person first. But when I moved, I became the outsider. I became mm. that oriental kid with no friends. Mm. And I moved mm. in the middle of a school year. My life changed Ugh. drastically after that. It was really a tale, literally a tale of two cities. Mm. That must have been so hard to go through that transition. But you had at least all of these years of feeling like you belong. Were you able to hold on to that feeling in high school and, in, and throughout life moving on? Yes. Uh, and the reason why you know, I feel the way I do now about race relations is because I know what I was missing. You know, once mm. I moved... I knew what I no longer had wow. and, and I saw the difference. There are a lot of worse things that can happen in people's lives. But for me, uh, moving that one, one town over was probably the most traumatic event of my childhood. 
Yeah. I, in fact, I you know it was the, it was close enough where I could ride my bike back to see my old friends. So every day after school or in the summertime, instead of trying to make new friends in my new town, mm. I would ride my bike back to see my friends in my in my old town, and that's how close I felt to them. And even to this day. I'm I'm friends with more of those uh, the kids from that time in my life than I am mm. uh, with the kids I went to high school with. Oh, I'm so grateful that Blenheim Drive gave you that fortitude. It created in you a sense of what you deserved. I think that's so special because a lot of kids don't get that early on. Um, they almost have the opposite experience. A lot of kids where they they are like fighting and searching for a belonging for a lot of times. Well, let's go back. Let's go back. How old were you when your family emigrated to the United States? I was one. So, oh, you, you know, one. I just, yeah, so I was super young. Um, but my, my brother and sister were both born in America. I was the only one born in Korea. And wow. so that, and my dad, my dad was, a, was studying to be a doctor. And so he trained in the Bronx. And then eventually he got a job in Pennsylvania, which is why we moved out to PA. Tell me about the inside of that house. Did you have a favorite room in the house? My favorite room in the house was uh, the family room. One of my overriding memories of being there is, uh, you know, Pennsylvania gets cold in the wintertime. Yes. And we used to, you know, get snowed in every once in a while. But my parents, because they had such an immigrant mentality, wanted to save every penny that they could. Um, yes. uh, and so when it got cold, instead of turning up the heat, to a temperature that was kind of uh, considered normal, would be considered normal today. In the middle of winter, they would set the, the, the temperature, the thermostat, to 68 degrees. Uh, and that would be as high as it would go. Wow. And so I was always freezing in the house. And our house didn't have central heat, so you had to go to room to room to adjust the thermostats. And it had like a, like a radiator, like an electric heater that was uh -huh. on like one of the baseboards along the wall. And there was a sofa right next to this heater. And to get warm, what I would do is I would squeeze my body in between the sofa, <laughs> at, right up against the heater, and I would lie there oh, next to the heater <clears throat> to get warm. Yeah. I think that's why I live in, that's one of the reasons I now live in Hawaii. I was going to ask you, warm. is this why you live in Hawaii? Is <laughs> you're trying to like recover from the trauma of not defrosting? Yeah, it's, uh, it, it might be, it might be left over from childhood. But yeah, it's one of my favorite memories. What, what are the sounds that you remember growing up on Blenheim and in that house in particular? My dad taught himself how to play the harmonica and he would play it when he was in a good mood. So mm. when I was in that house, whenever I heard the harmonica start to play, I knew I knew things were going to be good that day. His specialty required him to be on call day and night, every, mm. almost every day. Mm. And so, um, and my mom was cooking a lot uh, and taking care of us. And so it was usually like on a Sunday or like a Sunday night mm. when we could relax. You know, that Sunday vibe kind of a thing. Yeah, He would play things like... Um, you are my sunshine. Oh my goodness! Uh, and he'd play some Beatles. He'd play some Beatles tunes. Oh, he could really uh, play. Yeah. What were the smells like? You mentioned your mom cooking. The smells, the specific smells. Um, yeah. In my house, were uh, you know uh, bean paste. If you don't know the smell, you would say that it it's a stink. Uh, you know, I some of my some of my friends would come over to the house and go, "What is that smell?" Right. And then right. if you combine that with kimchi um which did your mom, mom make him did she make it handmade she <gasps> made handmade every everything so you know my m one of my favorite memories of bonding with my mom is when she would literally sit on the floor in the kitchen of our house with a big tub like a just a massive like vat uh, it, yeah like a vat and it wasn't even like a cooking vat it was like some industrial kind of thing because they didn't have anything big enough and she would be have her hands mixing the kimchi with all the spices and I would sit down next to her and and I would eat the kimchi out of the, out of the vat mm. as she was making it and mm. we would just talk and to this day my favorite kind of kimchi is the kimchi that is completely fresh because my mm. associations of it are with uh, are of my mom and the times that we had together 
Do you have her recipe? And can I have I, it? I do. <laughs> <laughs> I do. And my wife uses it. And now my wife makes mm. kimchi for our family as well. So, oh. uh, you know, that is one of the traditions that has been passed down. In, that in gave our me chills. That gave me chills. I love that. <laughs> is your wife from South Korea as well? She was born in Korea, but raised in America as well. Mm. She was raised in Connecticut. So wow. um, and she came over as a young, uh, as I think two, a two-year-old. So our stories are very similar. She's, she's learned a lot of my mom's recipes and she carries on tradition through food. I love that. So what about entertainment? Like you found yourself, you are an incredibly successful actor and producer, somebody whose career I really admire and respect. I'm wondering where did that start? Like, did you, were there TV shows? Did you watch Korean films in your home? Did you watch American television and films? What was your relationship to entertainment in that house on Blenheim? You know how K-dramas are like 20 episodes, right? Yeah. My parents would li literally have 20 ep uh, video cassettes stacked up on our TV right next to our VCR. And they would binge these K-dramas. They K were early bingers. And, oh, yeah, of course. They invented yeah, they binging. Were, I love yeah, it. it was, <laughs> They were all about it. And the, the Korean video store was like an hour away. Mm. So they would drive to the video store, literally get like 50 video cassettes at one time, and then just power through them. And I, I used to wake up at like, you know, to go to school at like six in the morning. And my dad would be awake watching Still Korean watching. videos. What, what uh, did you watch? What did you love? I was all about Americana. I mean, I... Mm -hmm. I watched, I learned my English through television. I learned what it meant to be an American through television. Uh, you know, I'm going to date myself here because uh, because I'm going to name check some of the shows that I loved. But like Great. L.A. Law, you mm. know, 30-something, uh, Hill Street Blues, and Star Trek was another one. I loved Star Trek. So all these shows were the things that I grew up on. And television mm. was so powerful and influential uh, as a way of kind of teaching me about the world. Is that why you have made it your mission to really kind of focus on marginalized communities and identities and the work that you're producing? Entertainment is really powerful. And I actually look at it as a, a passive value delivery system. You know, sure, mm -hmm. we're watching it for the plots and good looking people or whatever, but the, the ideas, the principles, the values, that are that are kind of implicit in every storyline, they are they are ways of changing and affecting narrative and how we see the world. And I think culture, that's a really lot of the transforming yes. culture. I'm really grateful that you said yes when I asked you to come be a part of Prophecy. And I'm I'm struck by why you're talking about the harmonica and the the sound of that because it's fun to be able to talk to you right now and hear your voice and see you because doing a podcast, I'm ju we're just working with sound. Um, and I wonder like, what was it like for you to tell a story just through sound when working on the prophecy? It kind of brings back the emphasis on imagination. In a society and in a time where so much is about representation, visual representation, I find it in a way very liberating to, to not have to think about that as yes. one of the primary Ugh. primary kind of themes. It's about what we bring as artists with this instrument, our voice, mm -hmm. and how we can create worlds and relationships with just 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 what we hear. It was so it is so fun to be able to go to work and do what we do without the hair and the makeup and the trappings of the last looks and making sure it's just like to just be human and be having feelings and like just expressing ourselves through sound. It's so exciting. When did you know that you wanted to be a part of the magic of storytelling? When did that unfold for you? Being an actor was not a thought in my head. Mm. We used to play like like Star Trek and, and superheroes. By the way, like I had the original like action figures of like Iron Man and Superman and yes, Batman back yes. in the, and I loved them so much. But, mm. uh, but so we used to play act I would, that we were Batman. And by the way, it didn't matter what color or what gender you were, everyone could play Superman and everyone mm. was playing Batman when we were mm. growing up. And that is the truth. It was after I moved to the, the neighboring town where I really felt for the first time excluded 
Mm-hmm. And I really did feel marginalized. And, and not everyone was doing it purposely. And there were very welcoming people there. So I'm not trying to throw shade on an Demonize. entire community. Demonize. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I'm really not. But it was at that point I started questioning my own value and whether I had something worthwhile. And mm. then I realized, and this is, <laughs> I say this like very easily, but it came with a lot of um, conflict and self-examination over years to get to this point. Um, but I realized that I had a need for expression that mm. stemmed from feeling stifled. Mm, being made to feel small. And compartmentalized. People were mm. defining me based on things that were not who I was. You know, mm. they, were ba- they were basing their definitions of, of me on this right. and preconceived notions based on that. And so, right. like, are, you know, do I know Kung Fu because of Bruce Lee? Mm. Uh, you know... <laughs> I must be a nerd. All these microaggressions. Not even micro, Carrie. Macro. When Sixteen Candles came out, that really, that really affected my high school experience. This was the entertainment I was consuming, and I never saw myself there. And so I felt like I was looking for a place in my life. I was looking to find a place in society based on what my community was telling me about myself and who who I should be. And they were placing a definition on me that wasn't who I was. That's where I felt when I felt like I, I think I needed um, an outlet for my self-expression. And that's when the arts came. I would love for you to shout out three stores or businesses from when you were growing up on Blenheim that really meant a lot to you? When I was a, like in second or third grade, one of the first movies I ever saw was at a drive-in theater. And there was a, a, a theater called The Starlight. Uh, mm. And it was such an event for me. Cause you know, again, we were an immigrant family. We didn't really know what the customs were. So I remember the first time I went to a drive-in theater with my mom. You had to roll down, crank down your window. Yes, and then, no oh, button, oh, roll it down. No button. <laughs> and then you had to hook the, hook the speaker onto your window. And it was the worst like AM radio kind of sound quality. It was awful. <laughs> Do you remember what the movie was? Yes, Sinbad and the Seven Seas. It was Sinbad and the Seven Seas. It was just fantastic. And uh, the second one that was such a huge part of my growing up, this local pool called the Stones Crossing Swim Club. This was the center of our, all of our, my friends' community. Mm-hmm. Everyone from my neighborhood would ride their bikes to the swim club every summer day. And uh, we'd dive and there was this little like snack bar. So we'd get French fries. So mm. like there was a, a group of like 20 of us who grew up year after year at that, that swim club. And that's, uh, those are still some of my closest friends to this day. Mm, I love that. We had a pool. I lived in a community called Jamie Towers, which was four buildings in the Bronx. And we had a pool in the middle. And that was the center of our summer. I mean, we were there before the lifeguards opened the gate every morning. We used to strategize eating our lunch around adult swim so that we didn't miss a single second of available swim time. It just was like, it, it really was the center of our world. <laughs> adult swim, remember yeah. that? Like adult yeah, swim. you'd be the, pissed right off, back. like, oh God, the adults gotta get in and exercise. <laughs> like it was what, such a drag, the worst. But you're so right, you're so right. That's when you head to the snack bar and get yes. your fries during yeah. adult swim. Totally. It's also kind of the center of like romantic life. <laughs> Did you have a celebrity crush when you were growing up at Blenheim? Did you have any posters in your room? Like, who were your heroes and your crushes? Olivia Newton-John. Of course. Olivia Newton-John. <laughs> like, I just, wow. The sun rose and set with, uh, with her. <laughs> it really, it really did. Um, I love it. Who was your crush when you were younger? I had a few, but I was really into the son on Growing Pains, who was played by Kirk Cameron. He was like sure. my dream. Um, and, uh, and who else, who else? That was the big one for me. And then I really liked, um, because I grew up in the Bronx, I grew up around a lot of Latin culture and there's a lot of Latin culture in my family. So I loved Menudo. That group was like everything for me. I knew all the words to all the songs, every, all of it. So good. So if you were telling the story of kind of your hero's journey, the fable of your life that started with once upon a time, what would be the first three or four sentences? Once upon a time, 
there was a little boy who never even considered that he would be living the life that he's living right now. He always thought that he would have a, a loving family uh, and good friends, but to be talking to someone like Kerry Washington <laughs> today, where p other people might be interested in listening to what we had to say, would be something beyond his dreams. I love that. I want to ask you about the Asian American Foundation because we're really lucky this year that we have some extra resources to be able to share with guests to pay it forward to the organizations that mean the most to them. Will you tell us a little bit about the Asian American Foundation and the work that happens there? And you're on the advisory board, yes? Yeah, I'm a co-chair of the advisory committee. The Asian American Foundation is uh, a group that was started last year uh, in the wake of the surge in violence uh, toward uh, Asian Americans. Its mission is uh, to serve the Asian American and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities uh, in their pursuit of belonging and prosperity. What we seek to do is not to kind of reinvent the wheel of, of community organizations, but to actually try and empower local community organizations around the country who are doing the hard work and have been for generations. One of the ways that, that the organization tries to help them is through funding them, mm. uh, to raising their platforms, to amplifying issues uh, around the community, and to change the narrative around Asian America and, and race relations in America as a whole. It's not to say, you know, Asian America over everyone. It's about Asian America as a part of a unified America. And I think that, I think that's, um, that's a message that I feel strongly about and can get behind. Mm. I feel like in so many ways, you're looking to bring that sense of belonging and equity and community that you had on Blenheim. You know that everyone deserves that sense of belonging and community. So I, I really love that you're paying it forward and we're so grateful to be a part of that story. If you could go back to young Daniel on Blenheim Drive and give him some advice, what would that advice be? I would honestly say that I would tell that young boy on Blenheim that there are no limits to what you can achieve. And there are, there are things beyond the realm of your imagination mm. that you will be able to do. And to just trust that, trust that it's coming. Even when it gets hard in high school, trust that it's coming. <laughs> Yeah, you know, and if it was about high school, I would honestly say if a familiar refrain, it gets better. Mm. Especially so many of our, of our teens today are struggling with issues of mental health and belonging and inferiority. And th these, these are not just about race or uh, religion or sexuality or gender identification. It's just about finding a sense of self-worth. Mm. I would definitely say to, to, to hang on and keep believing in yourself because it does get better. Mm. And is there anything, as you think about Blenheim Drive, is there anything that you had in your life then that you wish you could bring into your life now, whether it's a piece of furniture or a person or a song or a feeling? I wish I could bring back that sense of community where people could still go to each other's homes freely mm. and everyone felt like a neighbor and a friend in a time where we have so many shootings and that people are so polarized and there's so much fear in our culture, I would love it for, if not just America, but all of us could think of each other as neighbors and mm. maybe overly idealized, but I really, I, I really feel like that's, that's how we progress as a, as a species, as a culture. I expect nothing less than ideal hopes and dreams from the little boy who grew up in that idyllic house. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> the, the bricks were laid. It's beautiful. Thank you so much. It's really special to hear about you playing with all those action figures and having all of the characters be any race and then to see you in your career play these iconic roles like the dad and Raya and, and Avatar and like you're doing, you are actually breathing life into these super human, larger than life characters, you know, even in prophecy. And, and that, that is, it's so wonderful that those values that you had at Blenheim, that anybody could be a hero, that you're doing it, you're doing it in your work, taking on these characters. It's, it's so awesome, so inspiring. And so are you, Ms. Carrie Washington, <laughs> so are you. So fun to get to talk to Daniel Day Kim. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us. 
The man is truly a superhero. It started on Blenheim Drive, playing the role of superheroes there, and he continues to do it. Please support his work. He's the best. Make sure that you keep an eye out for Pantheon on AMC and for Avatar on Netflix, and of course, for The Prophecy on Audible, which is a narrative series on Audible that we worked on together. I'm so excited for you to hear it. So thanks so much. Keep coming back and make sure you like and subscribe and do all the things. And uh, that's the tea today. Bye.